All right, I think we will start. It's nine here or five. So I will share my screen. Can you see my screen all right? Yeah, we can. Excellent. Okay, so off we go. Welcome, everyone. Uh, would like first to to acknowledge the in kind and, and financial support of of the organizations that are listed here. We're very grateful for for their support. And I would like to spe specifically uh, thank the organizers of of this meeting. It's been a, a huge effort on their part. So a big thank you uh, to all of them. So this is the ITG04 session uh, titled Best Practices for Development of Vocabularies of Values, or as we like to call it, just vocabularies. So this is a task group that is part of the Biodiversity Data Quality Interest Group. And I, speaking, I'm Paula Sarmoglio, um, talking to you from Argentina. And please, we're remember that we are recording this session for later viewing. So I'm going through to go through the outline of this session. So first we're going to see a, a very brief overview. Then we're going to talk about what the task group is and is not about. I'm going to describe the activities that we've been uh, working on and those that are still pending. And I'm going to um, propose a series of discussion topics so that we can all talk about um, about them during this session. So about the overview, some, some logistics, uh, please keep your microphones muted. We will have discussion times where you will be able to speak, but in the meantime, please uh, keep them silent. Then the chat function has been enabled, so you can ask your questions and talk with other attendees. But please be nice in, in the chat. Uh, remember that any inappropriate use of the chat will result in either you being removed from the session or the chat function being, being disabled. And I would ask you all to refer to our code of conduct. Uh, you will find the link in the chat. So um, during this session, we're going to have uh, an introduction, a series of questions time, then we will uh, present the discussion topics, as I say, and break up into rooms to discuss each topic. And then we will come back all together at the end to, to discuss. So, so during, this, um, during these times, uh, you can put your questions either in a document that we have shared with you or in the chat. And I'm very grateful to uh, my helpers here, my tech supporters. So it's Dave, Dave Bloom from the US, Burnett team. It's Peter Huybrecht from the Mice Botanical Garden in Belgium and Tim Robertson from Chibif. And I'm also very grateful for the participation of other members of the, of the interest group, like well, Arthur Chapman, many of you know of him. And so they will be helping organizing the chat. They will give you all the links that, that you will need during this session. So all those links are also put in this document so you can refer all the time to, um, to those notes to check for information and to capture your notes, your questions. I would also ask you to please put your names in that document and if you wish to stay in contact with this task group and with participating in our activities, also leave your email address so that we can write to you and include you on in, in our list of, of, of messages. So let's go to the to the core of it. So what is the task group about and what it is not? So I'm going to start with what the vocab is not. And 
to introduce that, let me go to the title that we chose for this task group. So this task group is named Best Practices for Development of Vocabularies of Values. So starting with the last part, Vocabularies of Values. So to, uh, as a reminder, what is a vocabulary? A vocabulary is just a collection of standardized terms and their definitions. Now we're talking about vocabularies of values in this task. So basically, for example, uh, Darwin Core itself, it's, is a vocabulary, right? So all the terms that we find in Darwin Core constitute a vocabulary, but we're not talking about those terms. We're talking about the terms that we will use to fill in those Darwin Core terms if they were like in a spreadsheet, no? So we're talking about the values that we want to use. And then the first part of the name, best practices for development of. This means that the task group was not tasked with developing the vocabularies of values themselves, but to tackle the best practices to do it. And so I can imagine that many of you might, might be thinking, it's like, well, what am I doing here? I'm interested in the vocabularies and these people are not actually building vocabularies. Well, yeah, you might be right, but I will tell you about our objectives and then maybe we can understand how we can relate this task group to the bigger picture, which is actually building the vocabularies and using them. So our objectives uh, are first to understand the current state of vocabularies with respect to three things. One is the use in the data that is already shared out there. Um, the second one is the availability of vocabularies in the community. And in this respect, we have to know that there are plenty of vocabularies out there. And that is very common that each little group within the community build their own vocabularies and they don't talk with each other. So we have myriad files going around uh, that sometimes talk about the same thing. Sometimes they differ a little bit, but we need to understand what's the landscape of vocabularies out there because it's always the case that we do not want to reinvent the wheel. And then we want to understand which are the needs and the opportunities in the community. So the needs would be which are the priorities that the community has, which are the vocabularies that um, are most needed right now and that should be tackled first. And the opportunities is who is working already there, who has the will to do it. So, and try to build community around it to move it forward. Our second objective is to provide guidance on how to develop those vocabularies and how to maintain them. And to do so, we are tasked with building a best current practice, which is one of the types of standards that had with has. So when building this best current practice, we plan to also have a couple of examples of its use. So it's not we're not going to build any vocabulary, but we're go just going to tackle a few. So back to the no, it's true. We're not tasked with developing the actual vocabularies, but given our objectives, while the task group exists, we mean to have it uh, act as a connector between different interested parties out there so that we can nucleate efforts and we can nucleate um, and understand priorities and we can direct future efforts as well so that's about is the task group and what is not the task group so which are the activities that were included in the charter of this uh, task group and what's the what's the progress that we've made so far in them. So the first activity that we had was the preparation of a scoping document. A scoping document basically um, saying what is that we're going to do and what is not what, what, what we're not going to do, what we're going to tackle and whatnot. So the first thing that that scoping document uh, states is that vocabulary building within TADWIC, because this is a TADWIC group, must follow the 
Tagwick Standard Documentation Standard. That's not an error, that's how it's called, Standard Documentation Standard. And so Tagwick already has uh, guidelines, uh, actually a standard that says how to build a vocabulary. Vocabulary in general is from not only of values, but just any vocabulary. So we want to follow this documentation standard. So that's number one. Number two is about the terms scope. What are we going to look at first? Which terms are we going to look at? I'm going to go into details in this. Then there is which types of vocabularies are needed and then which would be the best strategy for building those vocabularies. So about the term scope, we determined that we're going to put initial focus on Darwin core terms. We know that there are other standards that need uh, controlled uh, vocabularies. We know that there are other other terms that are belong maybe in, in extensions to Darwin Core that are not of Darwin Core itself that also need vocabularies, but we're going to focus on Darwin Core for now. This doesn't mean that our work is not going to be scalable to just any other Tadric standard. Then the terms we're going to prioritize uh, based on, on a couple of things. First, those that actually say now in the Darwin Core standard, they say, they say recommended to use a control vocabulary. So we think th those have priority, but we do know, we do acknowledge that some other terms that do not currently suggest the use of a control vocabulary might need one. So we, we keep that in mind, but we're going to go with this ones first. Then we're going to prioritize based on those terms that need controlled vocabularies and that are included in the tests and assertions. The tests and assertions are a series of data quality tests that have been developed by the another task group within the data quality interest group that is the test and assertions. So these tests what they do what they do is they evaluate the the quality of the data for certain for certain set sets of fields and to do that they use many of them use terms that require or recommend rather the, the use of control vocabulary so we're going to um, look at those first because they are urgent to um, to implement this test and then of course we're going to consider community needs because as, as this work goes on people actually need some things more more, more urgently than, than others so we are aware of that and we're open to what the community might have to say in here. Then the next topic in the scoping document was the types of vocabularies needed. So we discussed a lot about this and you know there are different types of vocabularies. There are um, the sourdies, there are ontologies and we talked about what would be best to use for building the vocabulary for, for, for different terms. And we came to the conclusion that the most reasonable solution probably would be to build multilingual thesauri for most of the terms. This doesn't mean that ontologies cannot be used, they can, but truth is that the development of ontologies takes a very long time and the needs are today and right now. So we think that this already offer the, the capacities, the functions that we need to, to address our needs right now regarding vocabularies of values. So it is our recommendation from this coping document that we tackle it this way. As I said, there might be other terms like basis of record, for instance, that would probably benefit from tackling it from from the ontologies directly. Then, the building strategy. So, building strategy is not simple, and there are a, a lot of things to consider from the technical side to the social side of things. So, what we came, uh, the conclusion that we came to is that first, there shouldn't be a single strategy to build vocabularies. 
uh, we don't think we should be strict. We should be rather flexible and that people should be able to actually work on building stuff rather than putting a structure on them on how on how they should do it um, that, that is that is very rigid so we think there is no single strategy but we believe that everyone building vocabulary should first review what's out there already the existing backups that are available and then they should determine if a standard is needed and this means within Tadwig, for, for a standard to be a standard, is it has to go through a ratification process. That ratification process means that the executive committee has to look at what we're proposing and has to approve it. And then that has to go to public comment and the community has to approve it. And, and so it's, it's a long process before that gets uh, ratified. And then every change that we do to any normative part of a standard has to go through the same process. This means that any change that we would include in a vocabulary later on would have to undergo that, that, that process as well. So we ask people to build in vocabularies that they ask themselves, do we want it to be a standard yet? So maybe it's, it's, um, it's wiser to keep vocabularies of values that are in their infancies not ratified until they are stable enough and then we can go through the process of ratification. So this is something that we all have to discuss and we all have to think about. And then another another point that we that we highlight in in the scoping document is that we should try to support internationalization here because people is using it all over and we need to accommodate a community that is very diverse. And for instance, languages are super important for some parts of the community and they really need um, values in their own languages for their daily use. So we should try to promote that, that the vocabularies can support our whole community. And so the graph that I'm showing on the right of the screen is um, a, a proposal of a, of a strategy on how to produce or, or how, to, how to build vocabularies from, from, the, from the group's uh, side. That is, who would produce them and who would oversee them and, and so on. So we think that for domain-specific terms, uh, there could be specific groups dealing with those vocabularies. So there will be task groups within interest groups dealing with a particular or some particular vocabularies. And we think this is a good way for domain specific because domain specific needs the expertise of people on that, in that domain. So for example, if we're talking about uh, some term that, that, that is related to invasive species, we would expect the people that, is, that are experts in that field to contribute those, those controls, uh, those vocabularies. So that will be um, for domain specific. We have to, I, 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 would, like to, I would like to remind you how Tadwick um, works here. So just very briefly, there are interest groups that have bigger goals and, uh, and bigger visions. And there are task groups that develop particular tasks uh, within those interest groups. And all these groups are overseen by the technical architecture group that tries to cross fertilize these different, these different groups. So this technical architecture group would expect that it would oversee the development of those vocabularies just as it does with any, any standard that is created in any task group. For, so I explained before what, what we think should happen with the domain specific terms. For terms that are more general, that like everyone uses, we, we suggest that task groups could be created just under the, the, the tag, the technical architecture group. And so that they could deal with it directly there because it could be uh, 
of broad application. So this is the, the strategy, the general strategy that, that we suggested in this scoping document. We will have plenty of opportunity to discuss about this, this scheme and there are also additions that we will see in, in a couple of minutes. So that for the scoping document. So our second activity in the task group was the preparation of a list of vocabularies that we need for Darwin core terms. And there is a link at the bottom of the slide um, that uh, brings you to a, to a table that we build where we capture for each uh, Darwin core term that recommends the use of a control uh, vocabulary. If those vocabularies are needed for tests and assertions, which are the relevant tests, which are the recommended vocabularies because some of those already have uh, vocabularies pointing, uh, pointed to. Um, so you can navigate that list to see what's the range of, uh, of, of terms in Darwin Core that currently have uh, a recommendation to use control vocabularies. Then our third activity was to try to evaluate the state of the data that is shared already to aggregators and see how people are using uh, the Darwin Core terms, which values are they, are they capturing under those terms. So these data that I'm showing here are just examples and they are taken from GBIF data from last April. And these three fields that are on the screen, reproductive condition, life stage and country are three of the ones that are recommended to use a controlled vocabulary. So if I, if I take the, the last one, country, and we think that if we look at it from the country code side, which would be the, the values that we would uh, look at for reference, we would expect 250 values. And we see more than 32,000, almost 33,000. So you can see that the variation that is out there is very, very, very large. And well, we need to deal with this somehow because people need to use the data and to find something when it's, when it's in, in so many different forms is actually very uh, challenging. So you can see more of this data in the, um, in the set of, of files that we gather under the Darwin Core Questions and Answers uh, GitHub repository. You have the link uh, down there in the, on, on the slide and, and in the chat, I'm sure there, my helper section is there. So you can go explore. So the GBIF data that is up there is from April, but there's also data from BirdNet, from IDIC Bio and from ALA. Those are a couple of years old, but, but you can still get a, get an idea of how it is in, in those four different aggregators. And so I will pass now to the fourth activity that we had. There was the collection of already existing vocabulary. So what we did was very simple. We put up a spreadsheet and we started gathering vocabularies with their URLs and, and we captured which Darwin core terms that it could apply to and if relevant, which language they were in, and some notes, and which year they were last updated, and so. And we shared this spreadsheet with as many people as we could at every opportunity we had, so that anyone can add vocabularies that they know of to this list. So we intend this list to be um, a basis, let's say, for when we have to build, or someone has to build the vocabulary, they can come here and say, well, they have identified these different vocabularies that are out there already. Let's take a look at those first, and then we see if we can reuse some of that. So this is a resource that is open to everyone. So please feel free to contribute uh, to this file. It's also linked in the notes uh, document. And our fifth activity was the identification of the main specific groups that may or, or would like to be involved in the in the preparation of, of categories of values. This is an ongoing activity and it's more of a social thing and we don't really have a, a mechanism to, to capture 
this. So if you have any ideas that that you can think of on how to how to capture and how to share these informations with others, that would be awesome. Because so far as all all of us who participate in the in the group, we know someone that is working on that, and the other person knows someone else, and it's more um, more in conversation than in, a, in an actual resource that can be shared. So please add your your ideas to this to this topic as as well. And now we go to the um, core of the of the work that this task group is, is meant to to do and that's the development of the of the current best practice and this is something that is pending so the task group has been pretty much inactive for quite a while and that's my fault i'm the i'm the convener of the task group so um but we're we're trying to reactivate it and and resume the the activities and actually make this make this happen develop the the current best practice. So, but there are already a couple of things that we've been discussing um, for a long uh, time, and I will share this with you here because it's going to become part of this uh, current best practice. So the first thing, as I was mentioning before, is as we are a Tadwig uh, group, and this is going to be a Tadwig best practice, we uh, have to follow the standards that Tadwig already has with regards to vocabularies, which are the standard documentation standard and the vocabulary maintenance specification. Uh, these two standards, you can find also the links in the, in the notes. And also, if you want to see um, a summary of what the standard documentation standard says. We gave a workshop last year at Biodiversity Next uh, meeting, and I shared a link to the presentation that we that we use in that workshop. So maybe if you want to take a look at that presentation, you you would probably um, find the notes to the slides uh, useful. Um, so uh, aside from following the Tanwick standards, um, we think that there are a series of best practices that we are going to include in, in this uh, current best practice. One will be um, best practices suggestions about which should be the model and strategy for building vocabularies, which should be the minimum elements that is other metadata because the standard documentation standard already uh, has a lot of the metadata that any vocabulary should have but here we have to think about more um, which other metadata we would want included in vocabularies of values and this is pretty much related to trust or social issues that we're going to discuss a little a little later and during the the discussion time so that will be other of uh, another point for the current best practice and then some recommendations about publishing and how to make the vocabularies available repositories and so on so to adopt these best practices we would recommend that first the people building the vocabularies decide on a model that they're going to follow that they choose their partners their working partners and the overarching organization first if they are going to do it under tadwig or if the vocabularies are going to be built outside tadwig and then they will come to tadwig for ratification or not always evaluate the current availability and reuse whatever whatever possible and something important that is going to be in this document is that we concentrate the efforts on the terms and their definitions and not in the technical uh, issues uh, related to making these vocabularies into a particular format or turning them into RDF or whatever because those, uh, those technical issues are relatively simple uh, to solve. 
and then as i said before try to make this uh try to take a, a model to uh, and a strategy that allows the broader community to use the vocab that you're developing and also of course provide all the suggested metadata so these are these are the main points that are going to be part of the current best practice we haven't written the details of them yet and i hope uh, my expectation of this working uh session today is that we can discuss some of these topics and we can nail some things down that will be included in the current best practice so uh once the best practice is uh is developed we expect to build at least an example of a vocabulary of value that follows that best practice so we haven't done this yet either but there have been other groups in Tadwig that have been developing vocabularies of values and a very good example of it is that of the invasive organism information task group that has proposed um, a change to a term a darwin core term and the addition of two new terms and vocabularies of values for 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 the three of them so so that you know this is in public review right now and the public review ends on the 30th of september so please contribute to this to this review but well, the, and you can you can get um, you can read the the, the documentation. I, the GitHub issues that are related to this um, to these terms changes and, and additions are, are I believe linked in the in the notes document. And there is a paper behind it as well that explains why why the rationality of, it, of these proposed changes. And oops, sorry. And so the last thing. The, the last activity that was listed in our charter was the development of a common repository for the vocabularies. And this has been uh, also a long discussion. And we haven't, we don't have a definitive answer yet, but we're leaning towards the task group is not going to deal with this because we completely underestimated what this means. We've explored different options and we have seen uh, that there are different uh, technical and social requirements from people, what, what people think a vocabulary repository should look like, which are the functions that it should have, uh, what are the, what they will be able to do in, in, that, in that service. And then of course there is the management issue all around it who is going to contribute the vocabularies how is that going to be reviewed who is going to edit and well and of course the sustainability strategy so we're not going to deal i don't think with this in the task group however i will invite um tim robertson to talk to you about the gbif vocabulary server and i think this tackles perfectly this 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 task that we have so tim if you're around there i will pass it to you thank you very much paula um, before i do um deborah paul dev has her hand up maybe you could take a question while i'm setting up hi paula yeah. hi paula so uh this is from david shorthouse and he had a session already this morning and he's he's now sitting in the background here but he um brought up the good point that he's working on with the people interest group on vocabs to use when it comes to sharing information about people. And it's in development. Is it all right to add that to the list? Could we add a column that says this is a in development vocab? And so he could go ahead and put the information in the spreadsheet. Is that all right? Yes, yes. And you can put in the notes that it's in under development. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. Um, could someone just please confirm you can hear me and see my screen? I can't see you can. anybody. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I cannot see anybody or the chat, so please interrupt me um, with a microphone if necessary. So uh, thank you, Paula, and thank you, um, 
everybody for, for joining this session. Uh, my name is Tim Robertson. Uh, I work at the, the GIBA Secretariat. Um, I, I think most people will be familiar with GBIF, but uh, one of the things we do is we run a, a data indexing platform on GBIF.org. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing with vocabularies in this work. So this is the, the GBIF.org homepage, and you can click through to occurrence records, and we can do a search uh, for something simple like fledgling. So this uh, brings back some records, um, individual observation records. So this is a, an observation of a common kestrel in Scotland. And if we scroll down, you can see a field where the original data comes to us with the label of fledgling in its life stage. But we have excluded it as we've indexed data because it does not align to the vocabulary that we have for life stage in production today. So this is an example of where vocabularies are failing us for very common terms, um, such as fledgling, which is commonly used in the bird um, observation groups, um, for a simple vocabulary like life stage. So I'd like to explain to you why that is and what we're doing about it. If, hmm, how do we move that? If you look at the rs.gbif.org, this is the repository of schemas. And this, this, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> this was created many, many years ago. And this speaks to one of the questions that David Shorthouse has just asked on the chat, which is uh, how is the IPT, the GBIF publishing tool, picking up vocabularies? Well, it picks up its vocabularies from within here. So we can find the GBIF vocabularies and we can find life stage. So this is the original definition of the life stage vocabulary. It was crafted many, many years ago. And in all honesty, I can't tell you who was involved in defining this vocabulary anymore. But it's a very simple vocabulary with only a few terms. Zygote, embryo, larva, juvenile, adult, and so on. That is the end of the vocabulary here at Pupa. So it's a very, very simple vocabulary and it's missing the common um, concepts that people are using in the data that they are publishing through the GBIF network. What the current production system of GBIF uses is these vocabularies, um, which have been transformed into code, uh, Java code. So for those of you who are familiar with software development in Java, there's an enumeration in the GBIF code base called life stage. And this faithfully follows this vocabulary that was defined um, and put up for the community many years ago. So the problem here is we have very, very static vocabularies. We have things that were defined years ago that no one's maintaining code bases which faithfully followed that but are now in the position that if anyone make, wishes to make changes they need support of software developers. That's a position we're trying to change. So what we are working on is moving this out of code bases like this and enabling it in a database, a vocabulary server, which is something I would like to, to show you. Jumping over to the GBIF registry. Let me make this a little bit bigger. This is the administration console for all the data management activities within GBIF. If I log in, uh, because I am an administrator, I get more options than other people. On the left, I have a vocabularies option. And if I click on vocabularies, today we have two. There was only two because this is a work in progress, which I'm presenting to you. But I, I think it's getting to the stage where we do seek some feedback from the community. And I'm gonna put a call out for help at the end where I think the community could start getting involved. So there's two vocabularies here. The occurrence status has got two concepts, present or absent. It is about as simple a vocabulary as you can imagine. And if we click on present, 
We've got labels in multiple languages. We've got alternative labels. And then we've got hidden labels. So this is following uh, very much a, a SCOS-like approach. But you can see hidden labels, such as very, very abundant. We didn't just make these up. These are things that we are seeing in the data that we index at GBIF. So what we, what we now have, or what we're heading towards, is having an administration console that can actually be edited by a group of editors. So we could go in, we could click edit, and we could start uh, updating and modifying concepts, creating new labels, um, alternative labels, synonyms, multiple languages that are then stored in a database. When the editors believe they have completed their, a round of editing, they can release the vocabulary. So just like you release uh, software, you would release the vocabulary, um, which then becomes a snapshot, a versioned complete vocabulary, which is picked up by the data processing. So putting that all together, when people see data that is not being interpreted as they would expect in GBIF, they will have the tools and the process necessary to go in and change that. So it becomes almost like a collaborative data cleaning exercise. Let me just go back to life stage. Life stage in this um, server has got 39 concepts, which you can see here. And we support nesting of concepts. So tadpole being a, a subset of larva. Um, the, we wouldn't expect many levels of nesting. I wouldn't expect you, for example, to put a, a Linnaean taxonomy within here, but I could imagine one or two levels of nesting to be quite common. And we've, we've bootstrapped this vocabulary server, the life stage concept, uh, the life stage concepts by doing a data analysis. So this speaks to the work of what Paula just described, where we are looking at the verbatim data. And the way this worked, I'm just going to talk you through it because uh, I, I did this one myself. So I know firsthand what's involved in going through the verbatim data. I created a spreadsheet. If I jump onto the verbatim values, what I did is I ran some uh, SQL. Let me try and make this a bit bigger. Hey, Tim. Yes. A uh, question from Rich Pyle, uh, is the vocab database relational or triple? And then also, can you share the, the data model and schema? Good questions. Um, yes, it's all open source. Um, I'll point after this chat on the GitHub. It is backed by a very, very simple PostgreSQL database. Um, I should mention that this is fairly tightly coupled to the GBIF um, registry at this point. Uh, but it's something that we could uh, evolve in the future. So what I did is I, I looked at the verbatim data from GBIF. And if anyone is interested in helping, I will provide you as much verbatim data as you, as you can handle. So here I took out all of the, the life stages. We had 80 million records coming in GBIF with life stage. And I went through. So on the left column, this is what we are seeing in real data coming into GBIF. One adult, one juvenile, one adulto. And I, I read them. I spent some time just looking and reading what people are sharing. And quite quickly, you start to spot patterns. So I, I am the least qualified person on this call to build a vocabulary for biology. I stopped doing biology when I was 13. But I found this a very uh, interesting exercise because I started to learn around the life cycles of various organisms. I learned about firms and angiosperms and you know, what, what's going on in uh, amphibians. And so for me, it was very, very interesting and very rewarding. But I could start seeing very common patterns with different communities in the data that was already shared. And what I did is I, I simplified it into the terms, the 39 terms. And then we uh, worked with Paula and Paula reviewed what I had done. And uh, she laughed at some of my silly mistakes. 
and she helped us translate it all into to Spanish. And we started building out a vocabulary um, based on the, the verbatim data that we are already seeing within GVIF. And one, one point here is the people that are sharing data in GVIF, in general, they're not inventing these terms. They're already following some kind of guide. There's already been some thoughts into what they're putting into those fields. So this process allows us to benefit from all of that thought that's already gone in to, to the data preparation. So we did all of this work in a spreadsheet and we then uh, moved it out into the vocabulary server. We're now at the stage where we can make a release of this. We've just done our first release. The next thing that we will do is take this vocabulary and we will actually run it through the data processing in GBIF. And two things are going to happen. One is we do not have a life stage filter on GBIF today. So there's no way to actually search using the current vocabulary. We will enable a life stage filter, um, which will be backed by the vocabulary server. And we will also automate all of the processing of data to the vocabulary server or, or to the released vocabulary that comes out of that server. I expect that we will learn a lot in that process. And one of the things that I imagine that we're going to learn is how effective sorry, this interface is for editing and keeping an overview of the vocabulary. One of the things I can imagine that we do suffer from is that this interface needs some usability work um, to help communities uh, yeah, get together and collaborate around the vocabulary. But I think the, the core pieces are largely there that uh, we should be able to start building out these vocabularies quite quickly. So there's two things I think I'd like to ask of this group. I, I'm mindful that this uh, task group is not, uh, man, uh, not uh, asked to make vocabularies, but if there are people who would be interested in uh, helping us uh, go through the verbatim data and building out some vocabularies and trialing this uh, vocabulary server, we'd very much uh, like to work with you. I'm also interested in um, any observations or feedback on the general direction that we're taking here. Um, I would like to emphasize this is really coming from a need to clean data that we, we already have. I don't believe that this is where we want to be in five years, but I think this might allow us to quickly um, build out some baseline vocabularies using the, the 1.6 billion records that have already been mobilized through GBIF. So I think I'll stop there um, and I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see the participants, um, unless Paula asks me to talk about anything else. That was great, Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, many of the questions that, that you posed here for the audience are, are on the document. I put them down below as other questions uh, so that we keep them in mind for all the, all the discussion topics. Because I think the, the GB uh, vocabulary server is like crossing all the topics that we have to discuss all together. So, hey, what is, yeah, someone wanted to speak? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if this is a residual from before or if Deb has another question, but her hand was up. Maybe it just went down. No, I, I just don't know when it's a good time to ask a question, Paula. So, can I ask one now? Yes, we are now on, on the questions uh, time. We have like 20 minutes or so uh, to ask questions and then we're going to go into the uh, presenting the discussion topics and, and breaking up in, in I, breaking up I, the rooms. I want to clarify something for myself. I'm not sure if other people have the same question, but there's, I was wondering is this the kind of vocabulary um where we can add to it as we need it where it's not it's not like the so much like the vocabulary for basis of record where there's whatever those six terms are or seven and you must use one of those if your data goes out the door with something else is that okay so in other words tom morell was saying well that one particular vocabulary 
seems to be limited to a particular group. And I was saying, well, that's okay. You, you add the values for life stage that you need for your group. This is not meant to limit, correct? Uh, Deb, actually, that's what I was saying is in, in the case where, where you, okay, so if you have, if you take all, uh, like Tim just did, where he took basically all values for stages across anybody who's submitting, what, what you see is that the values become domain specific. I wasn't saying we're limiting it to a domain, but there needs to be a domain specific consideration. So we, we spent a lot of time with developing uh, pick lists and control vocabularies at field level within EMU uh, specifically for this reason. And it does take some agreement on consensus where possible to limit the actual values that are in there because if not, you end up with the Wild West. So I think you're simply looking at a particular process and I think that's what Tim was doing on his own where, where you you know you need domain specific experts to say, are we represented here? And are there places where we could use the same value to mean the same thing. If we don't do that, then mapping becomes a real nightmare. And then it, it just ends up over time degrading into free text. And I and I I can't say this strongly enough because this goes back to the group that we had two days ago on the basically the minimum level of Darwin Core records uh, or, or the core data that needs to be submitted if we are going to get to a place where we have better across uh, domain and institutional use of, of, a, of something like Darwin Core, it means that we need to all be talking the same language whenever possible. So controlling those vocabularies becomes even more um, important, I guess. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm not talking about limiting. I'm just saying that we need, there needs to be a vetting process. And I think it can, it can happen with those that understand the fields better. Hey, Tom, a uh, question came in for you while you were speaking, and it's just whether uh, some, uh, Rich Pyle asks if, if EMU vocabs are, are available publicly. Uh, we, we have, I mean, that's it. No, they're not. Because again, it's the, the problem with EMU, and this is, you know, I, I, EMU was foisted upon me when I took over this silly thing. Um, Scott, I'm actually wearing a, an EMU shirt today just because it was the only one I had clear. Uh, so I'm not advertising, but because of the uh, customization nature of emu it isn't uh, it isn't the same across all installations so uh, frankly i would love to see uh you know a single uh, core based data that everybody uses on pick lists for important terms and important fields uh, so so the answer would be no they're not available but that doesn't mean where we've made decisions uh, we couldn't share them i would say this became really important when we were trying to migrate in large field data sets to allow for data to be normalized before it came into the process, if that makes sense. So getting, getting researchers in that before they bring an import into EMU or into a collections database, we're all speaking the same language from the start. Imagine a world where we actually have a systematic process for moving data from its inception to where it becomes either uh, Put into a you know you know a normalized data store of some sort, and I'm not I'm not saying it has to be uh, relational or not, but that that we have some formal process for that. And again, Donald Core is great in many levels, but it's it's a disaster in some cases where we don't have uh, some control to it. I just uh, make make comment. Thank you, uh, Thomas. Um, everything you say there, I I, I wouldn't uh, fault. Or disagree with. Um, when, when I said I don't think this is where we want to be, you're kind of giving the reasons why. Um, what I'm trying to do is recognize that we're sitting on a huge corpus of information that much of it is not going to change. And even if we deal with a lot of project data and synonymizing and mapping and cleaning up that um, only makes it more useful. So in, in many ways, it could be seen as a, a data cleaning exercise. And the other thing is uh, we will always be working with communities that we can't um, control um, at GBIF um, when we're at this kind of scale. And by that, I mean um, there will be established communities that already have their vocabularies that we need to accommodate. And they may not um, align to, to what others are doing. So I, th I think there's always going to be um, at the kind of scale GBIF works as a need to synonymize and integrate across vocabularies. But 
I, I, I see an awful lot of data that I can, I can see that we could make huge progress quite quickly in cleaning. Um, and perhaps that would get us to the next level of coming up with some baseline vocabularies that we can then take through a more rigorous process for ratification. So there are a couple of comments on the on the chat. So one is from Patricia Madeira. Is that how can you control one research expertise area overrun or monopolize certain control vocabulary? For instance, the options available in control vocabulary or even the normative ones. And I guess that's a that's a social a social issue, and we've been discussing a little bit about it, but it it pretty much falls on who is going to contribute the vocabulary and how you're going to deal with connecting those communities so that they talk to each other but any other thoughts paula i would say quickly in in having engaged um this is many years ago, and created a resource called Apple Core, which was coming across all herbaria to standardize the it's sort of a best practice document to standardize terms that we use both to understand what the term is and then the vocabularies that are required to support that. I mean, that was a social experiment. We kept it small. We went to conferences and solicited opinions. And we still struggled within our own small domain just to get agreement within ourselves let alone trying to cross domain. Um, so it is a social problem. It's something that I continue to work on, but uh, it's the resource in some ways got stopped because of the social implications. Well, so here it would be, I think, well, we'll, we'll do this, this in the break, uh, in the break rooms is discuss how do we overcome that? because somehow we, 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 we should, right? We really want to use the data. And as Tim said, the data is messy and is probably most of it not gonna change. And so we have to change it uh, after the fact and without the input of the original providers probably. So how do we overcome those, those social issues? I'm asking for ideas here or to, for comments. <laughs> um, maybe I can say something. Maybe in the context of the interpretation of data by GBIF, or at least uh, looking at what is already used in the community that share the data, th that might be a way to um, prioritize um, some terms. And 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 do it do it in a in a very practical way might m maybe not um, uh, avoid being overrun by a certain community, but at least for the people who do share their data, then <laughs> then the terms that matter to them will be represented. I don't know if yeah, I'm that's a very sense. yeah that's that's a very good point, Marie. Thank you, and. Yeah, well, one of the things that we had in this task group was was just that prioritizing the terms that, that, that should be tackled first and say, well, these ones are the ones that people, for instance, need to to be able to, to apply the tests and assertions uh, work. So and another thing that I hear from 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 what you said and from the and from what others said, voice and chat, is that I I think of it of like in two in two different ways, no? From from the experts to the data, or from the data to the experts, and those are com two completely different approaches in my mind. So one thing is the is to take the data and try to clean it, and then see how we provide definitions for what for what we see that do not have to be uh, strict definitions in the biological sense in that case 
and as they were as Thomas I think was mentioning before is that things mean different the same word means different things for different disciplines but if you take it from the data down you can say well this is the broad definition of this term and in the comments say in this discipline is used as blah blah and in this other discipline is used blah blah and so in that way you could accommodate the other approach is uh, opposite is from the expert uh, to the data is define it the concept the biologically speaking and then accommodate the data to it which has a big uh, problem that is we don't we never really know what the people meant when they capture the data and when they share it so that's another thing we're, we're actually reading something in the in in the data that people share that is our interpretation of their interpretation which we don't know which what it was so th those those two different um, approaches are i believe valid in in different contexts and it's a matter of how urgent is this and can we take one approach as a first approach and have it done so that we can use the data and then refine from there and see how we will have to split some vocabularies into more as needed and, and, and so but I what do others think I think David makes a fair point in the chat that we certainly can uh, learn some stuff from Wikidata when it comes to social aspects Go ahead. Well, I, I, because of my co-host, I can't put my hand up. But um, yeah, I mean, in my own experiences, is uh, you have to be very patient. Uh, you have to talk about these things to as many different people as you possibly can. Uh, um, so coming along to Tadwick meetings and presenting it, but also going to the the specialist groups and presenting. Um, I know from my own experience, getting uh, ecologists aren't that interested in standards. They're always building their own spreadsheets with their own lists in. Um, but they are interested to learn about this kind of stuff um, and to made aware of it. Um, it. They have their own interests, which are much more focused on ecology and not so much on data. And um, but that, that's changing. So I, I think just keep let's keep plugging away at it um, and, and we do need their engagement um, but at the end of the day I think the other problem is we we can't keep everyone happy all the time we have to eventually decide on something and if we have done our due diligence if we've tried to be as inclusive as possible um, we aren't actually imposing anything on anybody uh, we are making a recommendation and uh, they can choose to follow that or not. We have uh, Lenore and then Abby um, with their hands up. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Lenore. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. You can hear me. Um, I am the chair for the OBIS's uh, vocabulary infrastructure project team. And I'm supposed to be working with you guys. I did put my email in the uh, participants list to link up with you guys. And our job was to, and still is, um, exist, uh, working on exactly what you did. We're going through the list of currently used values for the uh, measurement or fact in the measurement type and measurement type units. Um, I asked uh, OBIS's technical IT guy to uh, provide a QC list of missing, like you have one value, but you don't have anything for required value once you did put a measurement unit. Um, and then we're gonna try and map it to the existing BODC. We're trying to use an existing vocabulary that we can try and change so that we're not the holders and creators so much as one like yourself, we're trying to clean up the data. And then once we start cleaning it up, we wanna go through the formal process of having these added for the BODC or some other similar vocabulary. Um, group. And I look forward to working with you on this. 
but we're doing exactly what you're doing <laughs> to start. Then, oh, could I ask you a question back? Um, sure. The life stage, is it correct that you are creating life stages within taxonomic groups um, in OBIS? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, of course, I, I, we, we benefit from all of the, the cleaning work that goes on um, in other networks. Before I used to do it for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans for the Marine Fish Department Division as well, in the same way that you're doing this. I went through what was there, got rid of garbage, used expertise to help me, because I'm not, I too finished biology at the age of 13. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it's a long, slow process, but it really needs to be done so the data is more useful and exchangeable as well. Deb, thank you. Have your hand up. Um, yeah, but I think Abby, Abby had I hers up first. Yeah. I think. Yeah, Abby. Thanks. I just wanted to clarify something. We're not talking about changing the actual data, are we? We're just talking about mapping it to these sorts of values. So we wouldn't ever change the way that it's been provided. We would just map it. Is that? I, I guess I just want to confirm. There are two things. I believe, Abby. One thing is what we do at the aggregator level, which would serve the users. Another thing is that the people in the collections are asking for a drop down list that they can use because they want it also cleaned up in the, for their daily work. So it's a two way thing. So we would expect that whatever is applied at the aggregators level is something that someone can download as a just headers. Uh, a headers file and they can use in their own databases if not not a headers a, a list um a list of values so that they can use it for for their own daily work so i think it's both but that, that would be the data provider changing it themselves right that's not us changing it for them right like we would they would be doing that themselves they would say oh okay this is the pick list i want to use and this matches what i want to use right okay Thanks. That's also our hope from OBIS to do it that way. We're going to send the list back to the, the data owners and say, here's what we think, and please feel free to clean it up. My turn? Yep, go ahead. Okay, so I think the comment made about ecologists, and I know there are ecologists here in the room because I see some names I recognize. Um, I would like to say that I see one of the challenges is the beginning of what, what Tim built is it's one thing to ask an individual to go to a resource and download a giant file of all these values, but at least if you can get them for the term you're interested in, that's a step in the right direction. What I'm suggesting here is that if you would like communities to converge, they need to be able to see the issues easily. So I'm imagining a resource in which you could visualize, and I'm thinking of things like clusters, where you could visualize all the terms that are in a particular bucket so that a group of ecologists could sit in a room and look at that pile and go, oh, so that's what we're all doing. Because until we've been aggregating our data into these big piles, only relatively recently, it hasn't been that easy to do that. So I think building a resource that makes it easy for people to see beyond their own world, beyond what's in their own database. We hear people say things like from 10 years ago to now, I had no idea what was in other people's paleo databases. But once they could see what was in the drop downs for a given set of terms in somebody else's paleo database, then they began to understand, oh, I see how we can use the terms they're using, or oh, we can sit down and, and, and merge these. But it's, um, there's a, level of participation barrier there. So that's that's one instance I see where if we, if we want convergence, we build some visualization tools to make this easier. And we lower this barrier to my community uses a different term than yours so that people can see that going on. Um, and the other one is the potential value here for metrics. So this this for all of you, it's obvious if we, we can look at distinct values for a term and Tim and others, David Bloom and you Paula, you, those wonderful talks about how many fields are in the, how many values are in the sex term. Oh my goodness. You know, it's, it's so, it's thousands, right? So, so um, being able to see that 
and see that count and then see the community understand what their power is to go forward, I think is really key. We have to empower the community to understand what, how they can actually make this better. And the distinct values can tell us that over time if we're making progress. Thanks, Deb. So I'm going to ask everyone uh, what you think. We had planned to break into rooms to discuss different parts of the of this whole topic, but I don't know if you all prefer to stay all together or if it's fine to break out. So please, please put a, a exclamation uh, mark in the chat if you agree to split. I still had a small question for Tim. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, uh, in the meantime. I've stolen this from Richard, uh, but Tim, where would you like to be in five years? Sitting next to Richard in Hawaii. <laughs> um, uh, I, that's, that's a very, very good question. Um, the, there are the, the social community aspects to this that um, we just haven't solved yet. Um, what, who has the authority to make changes how do we converge on a consensus? These are topics that uh, are difficult and will be, will be slow processes. Um, I would like to see some advancements in there. Um, yes, that, that, that's where I would like to, to see us in, in five years, is more mature as a community of how we make decisions around these concepts. My job, um, however, is, uh, is focusing on data indexing and data availability and integration. And I'm trying to progress as quickly as possible what we can do at the moment. So I'm taking a very pragmatic approach to, to our um, developments here. I don't, I don't think I have a good answer for you with that. Well, nobody can see the future. Huh? So we were talking about splitting into rooms. Yeah, we were asking people to, if you want to split into rooms, as was planned to put an exclamation mark in the chat or to put yes in the buttons that you have in the participants list, just under the participants list, you can, you can check yes, if you want it. So, uh, Deb, yeah, uh, um, if, if everyone wants to go into breakout rooms, I will explain what to do. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, we can keep discussing. I don't think there is much quorum for the breakout. Sure, Arthur. Uh -huh. Yeah, we could, we could try to cover, yes, each topic. So, oh. let me... Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure what the rooms, what, what are the different rooms? Can somebody post that? I, I came in late, so I don't have access. Oh, there we go. Somebody just sent me something. Great. Thanks. <coughs> just that I haven't explained it yet. I'm going to share it oh. now. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Okay, give me a second. Also, if um, people haven't added their name to that document, could they please do it? So can you see my screen? Yes, Thanks. So it will be four rooms. The first room would be discussing basically the development model. And in the document that we share, there are a series of questions that we put in there. Of course, it's open to more questions and more ideas. Uh, but those are the guiding questions for the development side of things. It's basically, does this, would this model work? And how do we deal with um, the model that GBIF is moving along and how do we relate that to the TADWIC process? Do we want to include it and have task groups involved in that? The second room would be about the ratification is if we want ratification for the vocabularies in the TADWIC sense or not, or not yet, and what does it mean? And try to uh, try to understand if, if ratification brings us something to the, to the table, if it would make the vocabularies more used, like for example, it would increase the trust and the third topic would be about access and storing and how we deal with that and who has editing rights and other editorial panels or groups building um, 
the water and who maintains it and how do we sustain it and the the fourth um, group is about maintenance in particular if it goes through the target gratification way it will have a maintenance group interest group as of target process otherwise if it's external groups working on it it would need a maintenance on its own and how we will deal with it and all of that crossed by mainly four uh, important thing minimum requirements for each of these four things resources needed how do we manage it and how do we deal with trust or social issues so those would be the four uh the four rooms that that we suggested we don't have to if we don't break out in rooms we can do as Arthur said we dedicate 15 minutes to discuss each one i'll stop share because i can't see the chat so all that uh that graph and and the questions is also um they are also on the on the document that we share so you can look at it there so someone who has been looking at the chat in this last couple of minutes can give me a sense of what people want to do please numbers are going up in the yes and no there's eight yes six no so far we need to keep in mind the time we have left as well we have half an hour, is that right? Yeah, so then I would suggest uh, to go as Arthur said and not break up and and keep discussing. So if you agree, we can tackle the first topic that we had. And I would ask you to capture your comments uh, as we are talking about them in the corresponding sections because it's very difficult to, to to capture what everyone is saying at the same time and you're more fruitful if you can also contribute to it directly. So the first uh, topic is about the development and there are a series of questions there that are first, if that model that I showed where there will be task groups either under interest groups in TADWIC or under the TAG would work if the GBIF uh, model would work to do it from the data with groups analyzing externally to Tadwick and well, what do you think about uh, that? Some of that we've already been discussing. Um, here is uh, more towards uh, the next question is who, who is going to, to build the vocabularies? and it's related to what Abby was was asking whether it's from the aggregators or the or or the providers how do we do it from the data up or or from the experts and so on so microphones are open Paul or I'll start if you like um I I'll turn my video on as well and so people can see me. If uh, I see a lot of advantage in just having them under the tag, although that does create a lot of work for the tag in managing if there are a whole lot of vocabulary groups. Um, but having one or two interest groups with a lot of task groups under them. Um, I can see benefits in both those ways. Um, if if they could be grouped into a whole group, if, if the tasks like Tim was talking about going through the first one and virtually doing a data cleaning exercise, um, that could be done under an interest group with people tasked to do each of the uh, of the main Darwin core terms at the start or a group of Darwin core terms and then the second part as I saw it would be to be getting experts to I suppose validate the lists that that come out of the, the uh, process that Tim was talking about now whether it's best under the tag um, the tag often has a lot of the technical architecture group often has a lot of work to do themselves anyway, uh, or whether it's better under a, a group of 
one or two or more interest groups and then have a whole lot of task groups under that. I'm not really sure. I believe Martin had its hand up. Yes. Uh, one thing that, that came to me is um, like if we use, for example, uh, a strategy like um, building a vocabulary based on existing, uh, like for the life stage, you will never be able to capture all possible uh, values of this. So I, I think we would really benefit by having a, a very limited or a basic set for this vocabulary quite fast that people can start using it and some kind of other field uh, where you can put some verbatim data in. And later on from this verbatim, you can modify the existing list uh, if there are some trends visible, but having, uh, especially for collection management systems, uh, I was thinking having some kind of drop down uh, menu with already a very good basic set, uh, and then, but with the possibility of extending this would be beneficial. Thanks, Martin. I thought I saw at some point Steve's hand up, but I can't see it anymore. Steve, you wanted to say something? Yes, I did have my hand up. Um, so I was just going to comment that, um, I'm, and there is sort of an answer to this question already in the vocabulary maintenance specification. It basically says that um, Okay, at the time of adoption of a vocabulary standard, an interest group charged with the maintenance of the standard will be designated. In the case, where, okay, then skipping down, if a new vocabulary is related to an existing vocabulary that already has a maintaining interest group, the new vocabulary can be assigned to the existing interest group. Several minor vocabularies may be maintained by a single maintenance interest group. So I, I think the thing that we have to take into consideration is that all controlled vocabularies are not created the same. Um, for example, Audubon Core has a con it has a proposed controlled vocabulary for uh, service accent service access point variants. That's extremely stable. Those variants were defined at the time of Audubon Core creation, they're, no, they're never going to change. So that's a, a, an uncomplicated controlled vocabulary that's never going to change. There's a category of controlled vocabularies like the proposed ones involving invasive species, which are more complicated, but which come out of uh, well-established literature. Those are also going to be relatively stable. And then you have essentially the Wild West, which is what Tim's dealing with, which are things that are unstable and, and likely to change a lot. So I, I think rather than saying we, we have to come up with a single process for managing this, I think we need to look at the, each individual controlled vocabulary and decide whether, you know, if it's something simple and uncomplicated, like I mentioned with uh, variant types, it's obvious that the Audubon Core Maintenance Group can just take care of that because there's basically nothing to be done there. And, you know, some, it, whereas something that is really complicated and really mutable, like some of the things Tim's talking about, may never, it may not be possible to actually ever turn them into a standard. They may be too unstable. So I think we have to, we, we cannot say that we're going to come up with a one size fits all uh, answer for this. Thanks, Steve. You, you put into words much more eloquently things that I wanted to try and express. Uh, w w one of the things I didn't say is um, I actually wanted the results to be um, familiar to people. So the birding community are using, you know, egg, hatchling, fledgling kind of terminology. And if that's what they're using, I wanted them to be able to come to GBIP and do a search and find things in what they would expect. Now, when you start talking about eggs, 
Um, you can get into all different kinds of discussions with different communities. Up to the birders, that's what they would expect. So I was trying to, to go for familiarity there. And I think the, the not having a one size fits, fits all approach is probably what we're going to have to do. I also just to, to echo what Tim said, I think the approach that he's taking, which is to find out what what people are doing and what uses before you establish a vocabulary is the right, that's the forward direction, not the backwards direction. So, you know, rather than putting a bunch of experts in the room and having them decide the vocabulary, look at the data, look at what people are using, see if it's possible to sort it out. And if it is, then maybe develop it into an, a ratified vocabulary. But I think that the, the direction that Tim's operating in is the right one. Others comment on this on this topic? Quentin? Well, my, my comment is kind of tangential. Um, but one of the reasons I had time uh, to actually work on, on vocabulary development was because we actually wrote it into the proposal um, for the project we were doing. And if people don't think of doing that, it always becomes a, a weekend work effectively. Um, and uh, it takes forever. It takes, it takes quite a while anyway, um, but you need to plan ahead um, and you need uh, yeah, you need time and that and money helps that. Um, I don't know what other people feel about that. Thanks, Quentin. Anyone else wants to share thoughts on this on this first topic? So of course you can keep adding your thoughts later if if you don't put them in now. So Steve, Steve said a plus one from to the to the approach from the data up. What do others think? Is is there anyone in this room that thinks that it should come from the experts and from there to the data? I I think that it should be who, first of all, who are the experts? I think this is parallel to the tax on name problems and needing to be able to corral those into lists that we find valuable. And so who gets to decide who those so-called experts are? So I guess I would say, you know, I would love to see meetings where the botanists, the ichthyologists, the paleontologists, the ecologists are invited to weigh in. But I also think that's what I was trying to say about needing to make what's there very easy for them to see. So not a spreadsheet that it has a thousand terms in it, but a visualization tool that would allow them to really understand uh, what's in that huge pile so that they are encouraged to work on it together. Paul, uh, I would agree. I would agree yeah, with Thomas. that. Um, sorry, Deb. No, no. Brain. Uh, Deb, yeah, the, I would agree with that, but I would also say that, you know, having a fair amount of experience with this just locally, uh, without having domain experts to uh, have that process, you really aren't successful in meeting anyone's uh, needs. So, yes, I, I hate to relate this to the tax on names issue because uh, I live in that world and uh, it is as much of a social issue as it is a uh, technical issue, but I think it's the same problem where I think we could we could sell, we could start the population of what we think are valid terms and then ask for input from various domains and I think through the TCNs that you've already developed an IDIC bio you already have a, a great group that could start you know looking at some of those terms because again there the, what I was seeing is we need consensus where possible and uh, being, being uh, uh, aware of uh, domain specific needs. But again, anything that keeps us from getting to the wild west is, is a bonus. Not that I have anything against the west. So 
that's what I was trying to get at earlier, and I think there were comments in the chat. Are we trying to go toward the kind of vocabulary that we have under basis of record, where there's a fixed number of terms and people are supposed to choose from those in the future? Or are we just saying we're trying to reach consensus and show people what the you know million variations are for how to write mail or something and allow them to come to a consensus rather than you're suggesting we come up with suggested vocabularies and put them out there. I'm hoping that we can allow people to add another value if the thing that they want is not in the bucket. I think we're both saying the same thing. I think we organize what we have and then say, what, what's missing? What can you agree on? And I guess I would also argue, please show them the mess at the same time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, see, that is, that is how we got to field level consensus by doing this exact process. But again, it's only an internal issue. But I, I guess I'm thinking about community buy-in, right? And the more that they can see and own it, the, the better off we will be. Plus one. So here in the chat, there has been uh, some conversations. And one from Susan, for instance. Susan Matlin says, make a short list first. What is the main use terms? And then invite cross disciplines. To a meeting to start a process. I think that's a very good, very good approach. So, and as Deb said, if they could visualize it, it would be awesome. But that's a very, very good starting point. And uh, let me say that we have 20 minutes left. So, I would invite you to look at the other points. And the first one is. Actually, point number two is, do we need ratification? I think from what we've been saying, we expect that vocabularies could be changing and probably would not need a ratification right away. Any other thoughts aside from that? I will then, if no thoughts about ratification, then I will pass to accesses, storing, and maintenance. Maybe we can talk about that all together. So, where do we keep them? How, how do we deal with repositories for vocabulary? And how do we grant access to potential editors? So, thoughts about that topic? So, again. Um, so in the collection subscription uh, task group, they've been working in GitHub, um, uh, where you can, and, and a lot of the task groups are using it now for keeping track of issues. And uh, that seems to be a very good way of debating things and keeping uh, a permanent record of it all, a semi-permanent record. Um, but you need that kind of discussion. And then you can also then have versions of your vocabulary um, or control just like you would code. Agreed, uh, Quentin, but do you ambition, uh, for instance, to have each vocabulary uh, on its own repo or how can we make, how can you, we make a bucket? Like if people want to see what are the vocabularies that are used for Darwin Core, because sometimes people have those kind of general questions. They have to build their databases from scratch and they want to, they want them all. So how can we think of a general bucket where to frame everything? Maybe Steve has some input for that because I'm not, he, he must have a plan for where to put his gospel vocabularies when they're done. Um. Well, uh, I mean, in the end, if they're a vocabulary, they're going to have uh, a URI. Uh, like, I, people may not be aware of this, but uh, you know, the existing vocabularies have a URI, and we would want that to be dereferenceable. So uh, we don't really have the infrastructure in place to do this. But what I would envision is 
that if, if you dereference that URI and ask for JSON, you'd get JSON LD that would have the control value terms and the labels and uh, then a developer could uh, dereference that URI and find out what the most re recent um, version of it is. So, um, I mean, I mean that's not in place, but that's what I would think, based on the current infrastructure we have, would make sense. I mean, how the how that JSON gets um, gets created and where it comes from is another question. It might get exported from Tim system, or it might. If it's a stable thing, it might just be frozen on GitHub somewhere. But in the end, that's what we want to provide people with is a usable, you know, usable JSON or whatever that they could download at any time, I would see. And you think those should reside all together in a single vocabulary, biodiversity vocabulary repository? Is that doable? Is that well, so I mean, we, 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 if it's an adopted vocabulary, it's going to be in the rs.tadwig.org repo. That's where all Tadwig uh, metadata lives. And we're moving towards generating all the versions of, uh, of human readable documents, machine readable documents from the same source data. So that that doesn't work for the really mutable things, but for anything that we uh, ratify as a standard, it should be stable enough to live there. And then, like I said, the, the system for um, providing metadata when those uh, URIs are dereferenced comes out of that. So if it goes into that repo, it's it's going to become automatically available to people. Uh, you know, essentially as like an API. And what for vocabularies that would not, would not go through TED with ratification? Is there any, and, and here the, there's a question for, for team as well. Uh, is that, do you envision that GBIF could Post within the registry vocabularies that are not directly applied yet to the data, to the data that is in GBIF? And I see your hand up, Quincy. So oh, yes, me again. Um, so I'd like to point people to the, the proposed pathway vocabulary. So that pathway vocabulary was proposed in a paper, I think, uh, 2011 um, within the invasive species community. And, and pathways in this context means how a uh, a non-native species got to another place. So it might have been imported in shipping ballast or on an airplane or in a car or something like that. And there's a whole vocabulary published in this paper quite a while ago. It then got adopted by the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity um, as uh, terms for themselves, but they're not a standards organization. That was just a way of communicating about pathways within the CBD. So what we're doing is effectively making that into a standard to be able to be to be recommended within Darwin Core and making it into a standard, which it can then be adapted as a standard um, and have terms that are referenceable uh, much more um, machine readably, let's say. So we're effectively just taking it lock, stock and barrel from something published quite a long time ago and has already been through uh, a very big community of invasive species biologists and conservationists and the IUCN, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in that particular case, uh, that makes a lot of sense um, not to try and do all the work ourselves and adopt something that's already out there. And I think it very much on a case by case basis, we should do this and we shouldn't try and reinvent stuff that's already out there. Now, I think there will be changes to the pathway vocabulary um, that comes from the same place, uh, from the, the invasive species biologists. Uh, but we need to listen to them uh, before making changes to it ourselves. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. 
Tim? You asked me a question as well? Yeah, um, I asked you whether you think GBIF uh, registry could serve as a repository for book apps that are um, not necessarily uh, plugged into the GBIF pipelines? Um, potentially, yes. I think we need to progress at the speed at which um, makes sense. I, I'm cautious of over-promising, but I, I think it could develop in that way, yes. Thanks. Other thoughts? Can I ask you a question, Paula? It's yeah. actually, um, Abby posted something on the chat, which is an interesting observation. Uh, she was asking, where does the conversation happen to get involved with creating vocabularies for controlled terms within various Tadwick standards? And I had replied that, uh, you know, surely that's going to depend on which field um, you're, you're dealing with. But she, she does uh, point out that it's, you know, it's happening ad hoc all over the place and there's a limited number of people um, trying to figure out a path forward. Do you think it could be a role for this group to help prioritize and drive through vocabularies that people are interested in um, and actually act as the mediators to the other standard um, uh, interest groups? Um, to help people affect the changes that they, they are trying to get in? Well, the answer is yes and no, and, or rather yes, but for a while. Uh, the task group is meant uh, to work as a connecting point for the time that it leaves. That as soon as the tasks are done, the task group needs to be closed because task groups come and go like that within time. However, I do think that it wouldn't be a bad idea to have a, a follow up on this task group that might even be an interest group that deals with connecting community around vocabularies. So I'm, I'm not sure what the best strategy would be. For sure, the task group can serve as that uh, while, it, while it's running, but it's definitely not the permanent point uh, for the future. Uh, what do you, uh, the rest of you think about this? Uh, James, Quentin, Steve, uh, Arthur, obviously, what, what do you think about an interest group that could tackle this in particular? Would it make sense? All of us are being very quiet. Um, you know, I'm partially, one of the things I see in, in the Tadwick space is that we have a lot of interest groups and, and many of them come and go in popularity. Uh, some of them are practically dead. Uh, and sometimes we actually kill them and just call them what they are and we, and we stop. Um, but, uh, you know, we really, really want to maintain enthusiasm in the interest groups that we have uh, and focus on those. There's only so many of us, the volunteers, you know, greater volunteers. Um, and we really want to encourage task groups because those are, that's where the action is, right? Um, and so, you know, I tend to like to keep the number of interest groups smaller and try to bring in task groups inside of places that make at least some sense. Um, you know, the interest groups are only just sort of umbrellas and, and they're supposed to, you know, be broadly discussing that's the subject that is their interest group. But the task groups, I think, you know, can spin off of lots of things. So, for instance, I have no trouble with the vocabularies all spinning off of data quality. Um, they all improve data quality. So, you know, why can't the vocabularies, no matter what they are, just stay under data quality? I guess that would be my two cents. Thanks, James. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it, make, it makes sense that what you say about keeping the interest groups uh, to a few 
and also also what we've been saying uh, there, there are certain vocabularies that their natural places will be other interest groups uh like the invasive invasive species ones that it was natural that they were somewhere else but so let me let me see if i understand correctly what you're saying is that the others could be created under directly under the data quality interest group is that what you're suggesting I, yes, I'm only saying that because, you know, if you look at it in the big picture, these vocabularies are improving data quality. And so the ones that don't have a logical home in other interest groups uh, where, you know, there just isn't a really good fit, I think others could certainly just generally fit under data quality because of that sort of logic. That's just my opinion, though. Others? <laughs> So, so far, Abby, the, the place to go would be the data quality interest group. <laughs> uh, so far, where, where, and where is, uh, that's where, where the task group uh, lives anyway, the, the vocabulary task group that is, that is current. Do others think that it should be outside Chadwick altogether? Because maybe that might be another option that you could consider. So I'm not sure about that, but this is where I, I come back to who are our communities that we are serving. And so one that pops the top of my head is Spinach, the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections. And certainly they are um, international. There are members worldwide, right? And certain groups have coalesced and most recently the, the paleo group. And I wonder if they would weigh in just quickly on the approach that they've taken Holly or Talia or because it's coming from outside Tadwick, in other words, could you share just what you're doing? Sure. Um, yeah, so we've kind of generated a mostly informal group of paleo people involved in collections for the most part and collections data. So the data provider side. Um, and we have bi-weekly chats on topics where we cover a lot of things about how we're actually reporting this information locally, but then what that looks like when we try to map to Darwin Core. And in part of that discussion, we talk about the controlled vocabularies and how we should format something so that we can try to do it consistently across the paleo community. Um, what we are trying to do is then roll up any work that would have to go through TADWIG into the Earth Sciences and Paleobiology Interest Group. Um, and so the processes that we've been talking about this session is something that we definitely want to try to do as we make progress. But it does have a strong connection with spinach as well because a lot of our membership in that informal group are actually in spinach, not TADWIG. So one of the things I really like about that is, of course, the spinach members are becoming more aware and understanding of how they can contribute to standards. And that, that drop down is not just something that lives in their local database for their local use. They become aware that they're contributing to a sort of international vision for what happens up in that bucket. Uh, so they become engaged and they are actively as a group then sharing what they all have in their own databases for those fields together. So it's just one way in which I'm trying to say there much needs to come from the outside. So, I mean, it should be pointed out that Tadwick is a fairly loose group. There is no boundaries. <laughs> um, I don't know how many people here today are, are actually members of Tadwick or not. We don't ask that question. Um, we don't block anyone from contributing. Um, but I know Paula, uh, also is interested in the uh, engagement of people outside the sort of English speaking world and there are many people here as well um, but we do need to make efforts to make our vocabulary as multilingual as, as Paul has already said and, and also get engagement from those communities about things that interest them.
other thoughts? At this point, we have five minutes left. So any final thoughts about any of these topics that we've been talking about? Um, I'll make us a, uh, a summary of all this meeting as soon as we get the recording and we'll, we'll try to capture all of it, uh, not before the weekend. Uh, but in this same document, and if so, if you want to review what has been said, uh, it probably next week, you, you can take another look in and, and check what we've been discussing. And also, please keep adding your comments uh, to this document. Um, any final comments from anyone? Any Anything that you want to, to say? Well, Paula, I'll say quickly that uh, Arthur and I are having a go in the, in the chat here, just, and, and I don't disagree with him, um, that, you know, there might be a good rationale for the external, um, you know, interest group for things that just don't fit. Um, I, you know, it, it's certainly something that uh, if we can write a charter, if someone's willing to write the charter and present it uh, with the evidence that's required there, then certainly we can, uh, as the executive look at that and, and make comments and, and go through that process that we always do of sort of back and forth. Um, so I'm certainly, you know, I'm only speaking as myself and just keeping things simple, but uh, there's every reason, you know, there's, there's no reason not to present a charter for that if, if people feel that's reasonable. Okay, thanks, James. I will say just a couple of things to, to wrap this up. Uh, I'm the convener, as, as you you now know uh, after this meeting. Uh, I would encourage you to write to me if you if you want to get involved. I also ask you to put your emails, in, your email addresses in the document, so that we can stay in touch. Uh, I will try to reactivate this group, which has been pretty much dead for for a while, um, so that you know in the original uh, charter there were. 17 people listed as core members of which some are still engaged in the group and some aren't so i would very much appreciate if if you're enthusiastic about participating that you tell me uh i want to participate and i really want to to do something about it and and you can consider me a core member of the group that would be awesome so if any of you wants to get in as a core member you're more than more than welcome another thing is a very drafted timeline that has to uh, change from what was originally proposed in the charter um, we'll be working on the best current practice in the next months and we expect to have the draft hand into the executive around late January so that they have a February plus to review and then we have uh, a couple of months of adjustments uh, as needed, but that's more or less the timeline that we expect, which is already late with respect to the original plans, but we're, we will try to, to have some progress in here. And in the meantime, there is the ongoing development of vocabularies in other groups, which we're going to try to communicate more with, and the bill in the community, which was what we were just talking about. Just trying to nucleate. So I will take two things more. Remember that this uh, conference has another part in October, and many of these topics are also addressed in in the talks of other peoples all around. So I invite you to to come to the to the to the virtual conference in October. And remember, there are three more sessions today. There is uh, the work uh, workshop for biocase and IPT in a couple of hours, and there is the workshop for the living atlases and the uh, interest group meeting for the machine observations later today, and more sessions tomorrow. So um, you're invited to all of those. And now I will stop sharing, but not before thanking every one of you and every one of the people who has uh, been moderating here with me and participating. So you have like 15 seconds for a, for a last comment. IPT workshop is in 30 minutes. 
yeah no well i i have i see the hours and here is is different <laughs> so it's i have it's very soon so come to the ibt <laughs> workshop very yeah, time, take a coffee <laughs> time flies differently in argentina So Alex Hardesty just joined us. Welcome, Alex. We were just uh, finishing Hello. the session. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks, Tim, a lot. Thanks, Peter, Dave, Arthur, and everyone who participated. Thank you all. Thanks uh, to you, Paula. Hi everyone. Um, so we'll need to um, stop the recording now. Peter?